Good evening, everyone. I'm Catherine Huffman. I'm the executive director of the Square One Project. It is a privilege to be here with all of you all tonight, a privilege to be here with our two presenters, discussants, interviewers of each other this evening. Um, we've had a wonderful couple of days here in Durham, North Carolina at the inaugural convening of the Roundtable on the Future of Justice Policy. We've been digging in on what it means to think about our history of racial and economic inequality in this country. How does that, how is that relevant to our current justice policies and practices? And it's been just an incredible, incredible discussion and incredible honor to be here in Durham with so many of the thinkers and leaders of this town and this area and to be here with all of you all. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight um, Marlon Peterson and Melissa Harris Perry. Marlon is the host of the Decarcerated podcast, a professional interviewer, and the chief reimaginator of the Presidential Group. Um, his list of awards and presentations are too long to mention. The one I will mention is that he has a terrific TED Talk called Am I a Human? A Call for Criminal Justice Reform. And if you haven't seen that, I recommend it with all that is in me. And if you just Google Marlon Peterson TED, you'll get it instantly. And it's, it's, worth, it's well worth the time to listen to that. Um, he is joined here by Professor Melissa Harris Perry, a professor here in North Carolina at nearby Wake Forest. Um, another person with too many <laughs> Exactly right. She's here with some of her students and some of the uh, some of the students who are working with her on the Wake the Vote project that's based there and that is uh, is is um, part of her many many responsibilities um, at Wake Forest. She's there also the Anna Julia Cooper, the founding director of the Anna Julia Cooper Center, and she is the Maya Angelou Presidential Chair at Wake Forest. Um, another person who has far too long of a list of credentials and accomplishments, but she's an amazing author, an amazing journalist, an amazing, amazing speaker, an amazing analyst, and I really just feel so grateful and lucky to be able to listen in on this conversation between the two of you all. Um, while, we're, uh, while we're listening, we will have a little time at the end to um, have some Q&A discussion with the audience, so be thinking about that. And I also encourage you, um, you should all have gotten a card as you walked in that has a blank back to it. Um, the card gives you some ideas about ways that we might reimagine justice, which is the undertaking of the Square One Project. I encourage you all to take a minute while you're listening and thinking to write down some of the ways that you would reimagine justice, and we'll gather those as, as you go out, because all of that is part of what's informing our thinking in this project. So with that, I will hand it over to Marlon and Melissa, and you all take it away, and we'll join you again shortly. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Catherine. How are you, Melissa Harris? Should I call you Dr. Perry, Melissa, MHP? What's happening? I think the students tend to call me MHP, um, so that seems fine. MHP? Yeah. Um, I'm honored to be able to speak with you in person. I'm a fan of your show. In so many ways, I, I say that the podcast that I started was literally ideated from watching your show um, because uh, the way that you use your platform to amplify and to give uh, uh, give a spotlight to people who wouldn't normally be on television like that. And I really appreciate it. I think you should give her a round of applause too for that. So um, so I, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, I always, whenever folks say that, I always have to remind that. So I was the host, I was the person sitting there, but you know, um, TV is, um, it feels, like magic, um, but it was always a collective effort. It's just that you only see the one person and there's one person's name, um, but that process was always a, a whole group of people who were committed to it. Um, and so it's part of the reason that I mean, it was Melissa Harris Perry, but I, um, you know, we would call it Nerdland. Um, and so it was a it was a team of producers. Um, and in the four years that we were on air, I think um, we had, I think over those four years, two, maybe three cis straight white men. One was the executive producer, but other than that, um, uh, I think we only had three cis straight white men um, who worked for the show. Everybody else was some other set of identities. And um, that's part of how, um, how we turned out the way we did, was that people were, um, uh, were making a show that was what they wanted um, to see on air. Appreciate that, I really appreciate that intentionality behind how you orchestrated that show. Now we're here 
uh, at Square One. This is a project of Square One and thinking about reimagining justice. And if you're watching on the live stream, hashtag is uh, reimagine justice. And use Nerdland here or <laughs> decarcerated. Just throwing that out there, plugs. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, Nerdland, Nerdland's gone now, it's so gone? it's fine. To, yeah, I mean, Nerdland's gone. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I want to get some of the important stuff out of the way. So Melissa's from New Orleans. I'm from Brooklyn, but my family's from Trinidad. And we were just sort of like, which carnival is the best carnival? And I just had to say my carnival, Trinidad carnival, is the best. You conceded? I, I conceded <laughs> that, that it's either y'all or Rio, probably. Okay, okay. But you can go to ours without a passport, so. <laughs> <laughs> um. So this conversation that we've we've been uh, there's been a group of us that has been speaking about issues of uh, like really reimagine like we can start from square one what will we do to change all the things that we are that exist right now in this day and we think about how big and how much of a problem mass incarceration is but all the other touch points of the justice system the prison is just one touch point of it um, and and you know, the work that you have done you are obviously you are amazing a scholar a writer a journalist a cultural critic. Um, what brought you to this? Like, of all the things you could do, why is it that justice reform is something that uh, that that matters to you specifically? I mean, I think there are there are many things that matter to me, but um, justice reform is crucial I, um, for so many reasons. Some of them are personal, some of them are um, completely intellectual. So um, let me start with the completely intellectual. So let me start with my head, because it's always easier for me to start with my head. Um, so Marlon, when you say this idea of reimagining from square one, I have to go to um, this story that Monique Morris tells, because I think it's just the most powerful um, way of encapsulating it. She talks about fairyland in, um, uh, Southern California, which was apparently the precursor to Disney. And so this is like, like a kid's play zone, right? This is like absolutely just imaginary. And they just build it as this fantasy space, it's literally called fairyland. And so what are you gonna build if you build a, basically a, a human-sized Lego space you know, you're gonna put in the general store, and you know, you're just gonna put in like the, and they put in a jail. They put in a frickin' jail in frickin' Fairyland. And the first time that I heard Monique Morris tell that story, um, and the idea that we have actually so little imagination that we, we can't fathom that Fairyland could exist without prison. Like, because some of the fairies are just gonna like get out of hand and <laughs> right like I mean like why in like like why in a completely imagined space would we still need to imagine jail um, so from a completely um, like just in my head answer that alone our um, our inability to fathom a world without incarceration is troubling and is so um, like base level troubling to me that um, just my professorial angst wants to fuck with that, like wants to trouble that, wants to mess with that, wants to turn that over, wants to like apply black girl skepticism to that and say, if we can't imagine that, then we must imagine that, right? So like the, the um, great American impulse is to say, oh, you think, you think governments exist because God made you king? No, governments exist because of consent of the governed. How about that sucker, now what? Let's see what happens next, ha <laughs> ha, right? I mean, like, that's kind of what we do. So up here, that's the answer. But I'm also the little sister. I share my birthday, October 2nd, with, I'm the, I'm the youngest of five but I share my actual birthday, October 2nd, with my brother, who's the only boy in the family. So there are four girls and one boy. My brother Billy and I share the same birthday, October 2nd. And my brother Billy has, I don't even know if he's in or out right now. Like, he's been in or out always. 
and he is tall and brilliant and everything that you would expect. Like that my brother, he's just great and fabulous and eaten up by the system. He's nine years older than me. And I guess went in the first time um, in his early 20s and is now 54. And again, I, d I, I genuinely don't know right now if he's in or out. I think he's, I think he's in right now. I'm also um, a, a sexual assault survivor and have needed to think about what would justice look like. If I know that I don't think justice looks like anything that my brother has ever experienced, then what is it that I think would be a just or fair outcome for the men who have raped me? So there's one set of answers up here in my head and then there's another set of embodied and lived experiences. I think it's important to take like a brief pause um, after that. How about just a second? Okay, so we got wine up here, just letting y'all know. <laughs> Um, apparently we w they said we might get in trouble if we drink wine on here. And what was your response? Have you met us? <laughs> so I've been in trouble a few times myself. If you know, if you, if you watch a TED talk, <laughs> I've been in a little bit of trouble myself. Um, here's the thing. Uh, we have, uh, in this country, right, in, we've had centuries of what I think you're speaking about is, a, is trauma, like familial trauma of, of carceral spaces. There's no point in time in this nation when black folks, brown folks, people of color has not been entrapped by some sort of carcerality. There's no point in time. From the time they, 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 they brought us over here. And even those that, like my parents who came in as immigrants, like there's no time that it didn't happen in this country. Um, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that, like how can we change the story? Like our collective inability to, like what's behind our collective inability to change this story about, um, our experience in this country. I mean, is it changeable at this point? You think about, <laughs> please forgive me for saying this, you think about Kanye, um, who, you know, at some point he said, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta, it's 400 years, we just ain't thinking differently, you just gotta change it. Um, and that's the only time I'm gonna bring him in, because that's the only time I think it's necessary to do so. Um, but I think that asked any of that comment, but I'm just sort of thinking about, well, you know? Well, okay, so it, it is and it isn't, so. Oh, Kanye. Oh, Lord. Please. Oh, Kanye. Please. So, so first, let's, let's always, let's start with the question, am I human? Right? So let's start with our, um, our, our most empathetic selves. Right? Not because anyone deserves it, not because anybody earned it, but because grace is something we would prefer. <laughs> so let's just offer a little bit of it, right? So let's just give as much grace as we can. So in my most empathetic, most gracious, least petty self, now we might go to Petty Corner later because I enjoy it. <laughs> yes. I mean, Petty Corner is a, oh man, it's a fun place. Three more sips, we'll go to Petty Corner. But let's just, but let's not start in Petty Corner. All right, so in our most gracious, most empathetic selves, let's look at our human friend, Kanye and ask ourselves a few questions about our human friend, Kanye. So human friend Kanye seems to likely have some kind of mental illness. And it's not clear whether it's diagnosed or undiagnosed. It's not clear whether it's medicated or unmedicated. It's not clear whether it is, um, whether it seems to me that it does seem to have some rhythmic um, relationship to the time of year when he lost his mom. So basically every fall he goes a little batshit um, and again, as a survivor, I get that. Like, you bring me up to my anniversaries and I will be especially not friendly. Um, and if you haven't done a whole lot of work on yourself and you're not super aware of yourself and you exist in a celebrity world where people mostly don't provide you a lot of 
honest feedback about yourself, but instead a lot of smoke up your behind feedback about yourself, I could see where um, your potentially undiagnosed or not well medicated mental illness that exists on a cycle of trauma could performatively end up with some madness in the White House. I could see how that could happen. And then you have a White House that instead of protecting your crazy by not putting it on air, is prepared to exploit that crazy. So as, 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 as crazy as that is, you know, the, the far more exhausting and traumatic crazy for me was the narrative that said, um, this is a dangerous time for men in the country um, because they might be um, falsely accused of sexual assault and um, have their professional careers taken away by dishonest women who um, have little evidence. And again, you know, you brought up the, the history of um, the carceral state. And I'm thinking, well, there, there was definitely a time when it was dangerous to be a man um, and have the possibility of uh, false rape charges. I mean, that's a, that's a real thing. That's a, there is a real history of that exists. That, that is a real history. Um, and that's a history of lynching. Um, but even that history is complicated because oftentimes the white women over whose bodies these, or whose stories these crimes were committed, were themselves um, being exploited or used by white male power structures. So we just had this whole conversation around Emmett Till, um, and it was so easy to villainize just the wife in that moment for having said this thing to Roy Bryant. Um, but very few people spent much time asking questions about what Carol Bryant's life was like and I would like to remind everyone in the room that any man who would murder a 14-year-old boy pulling him out of his bed and do to that 14-year-old boy what Roy Bryant did undoubtedly beat the crap out of his wife and children and that the kind of violence that that woman probably lived under um, was also a violence that we should take into account. It does not excuse it. It does not make it acceptable, but it should help us to understand intersections of patriarchy and racism and how they work together to create a system of violence and lynching and that we would not fix one. We can't, it's not just racism. It is racism and patriarchy operating together such that white male violence operated in part by telling a story through white women. It was not exclusively just white women out doing terrible things. And yet, in my most gracious, I remember that it's actually easier to believe that Dr. Ford's a liar. And it's actually easier to believe that you could just shake off slavery because it's actually just easier to believe that. It is easier for me to send my kid to college if Brett Kavanaugh is not a rapist. And it is easier for me to go off into the world and try to achieve my PhD and live my life if I'm not fighting 400 years of structural racism that continues to exist. If I can just shake it off, if I can pull up my pants, turn off the hip hop music, name my kid Joe instead of Jamal, and fix it through individual effort, if I can positively affirm Oprah my way out of it, if I can keep my brother Obama through it. Like there are actually versions of that little Kanye narrative in a whole bunch of people who we like just fine because that story is a way easier story, T.D. Jakes. So it's easy in Kanye because he cray and wearing a red hat and hollering at the White House. But all of us would prefer to believe that we can individually fix it or that each individual person 
we can just me to one, we'll just fire Matt Lauer and then all the rapists will be gone from NBC. Thank you, Jesus, for Roman Farrow. So I guess what I'm here to just say is, nah, like this struggle, I am not smarter than Harriet Tubman. I'm not more badass than Ida Wells. Shh. Anna Julie Cooper went back for her PhD like five years after the age I am right now and then went to Paris and then wrote that bad boy in French. I have it on my desk and cannot read it. I cannot read it because it is in French. And she wrote it in her 50s because they ran her out of DC because she was a little bit like me. She just would say what she wanted. And so I'm not better than any of, I mean, imagine that I'm more badass than Ella Baker. Police. So they didn't just, fi they didn't know. They weren't just like, oh, you know what? Psh, all right. So we go to ABC, one, two, three, four, five, six, double jumps, three. Let's do it. Braces them over. We got it. Let's go. Oh, this shit is hard and it will change shapes and it will jump up and it will do and so that's so we just stay in it we'll just do our little part and we'll pass it on and they will do their part and they'll pass it on they will do their part but like no people like power and they're gonna keep the shit out of it and they will just like keep 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 keeping it and you can't just like argue them out of it because like oh you gonna make them a better argument no well you know I'm gonna like problematize that a little bit because I was having a conversation with somebody and uh, they had said, well, it's a debate about Kanye and A, uh, said, you know, we spend so much time thinking about the problem. We, if, we t if we just spend so much time thinking about the problem, it doesn't offer us any time to think about the solutions. And Kanye, if you, in his, ra in his rambles, you know, he's sort of just saying something similar. He's trying to articulate something like that at, at different points in time. I mean, what do you say to that? I mean, can we, with this whole positive thought and forward thinking, you know, and, and can we just think ourselves, do we spend too much time thinking about the problems? I think we need to spend more time reading. I don't think we can think about, like, I, read. I just haven't noticed that he's reading. I, I mean, I, people who read, are you can tell. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of time speaking about Kanye. Um, and, but here's the thing. What, and I don't think that's necessarily so much of a bad thing because he represents something at this point in time. Um, one is that um, we can easily discard him and say he's mentally unstable, right? And, and, and I don't think that's the right thing to do. No, Obviously, Ill. we shouldn't. Ill is different than unstable. Unstable. Mentally ill. Correction. Um, but he is a product of the same environment. He's from Chicago. He's from a, a place that has had a lot of embedded racism, um, that's why the, the, the city is the way it is in so many ways. So he's a product of the same thing. He's a product of the same thing that I'm from um, in Brooklyn. How well do you know Chicago? I think I know it okay. Because he's I'm from just like... just two weeks ago. Right, because I'm just saying, <laughs> he's from like... Because the part of Chicago he's from is like Michelle's part. He's from like striving black middle class Chicago. His mama was Chicago State University professor, which is like... It's not an HBCU just because it doesn't get the H part, but it's a it's a BCU. <laughs> um, it, he, there's a part of Chicago that is so I don't know if you remember in 2008 there was um, there was that New Yorker cover where they had um, uh, Michelle and Barack um, and it was. Presumably, <laughs> it, it, it's just so perfect, right? Because presumably it's satire. But the, but the, the illustration in it, and the reason I'm saying Barack is because he was not President Obama at the time. He was still candidate Obama. He was Senator Obama. So Senator Obama in the illustration is wearing something that he actually wore in real life, right? It comes from that photo, which we now know the Hillary Clinton campaign did leak. She did, she did, that happened, that happened. Everybody just be with your life, right? But he's wearing traditional Somali dress, right? And he really did actually wear that in real life. Now, the meaning that people gave to that was troubling, but he actually wore that in real life, candidate Obama, Senator Obama. And they're standing in an illustrated 
right, White House, and there's a Constitution burning in the fire, right? Do y'all remember this? Right, okay. But, the, but the, the killer, the kicker is Michelle Obama because she's standing there in fatigues and combat boots and she has a machine gun strapped over her back and she's wearing a um, big natural afro. Now, again, Senator Obama had actually worn what he is represented in that illustration. Michelle Robinson didn't one day in her whole south side, double dutching, great migration, middle class life, not never, never, never own no pair of combat boots, near not never own no automatic weapon, and damn sure to never go out the house with her hair like that. Never. And if you're from the South, like, you just know, hey. I mean, you can look at her little baby girl picture, that shit is laid. <laughs> That's the Chicago Kanye's from. Now, if you go back to the first album, College Dropout, that's what makes this shit fucking brilliant. It's because he's like, I'm working at the Gap. I'm working at the Gap. And my main racial angst is that they think I'm going to steal from them at the Gap. And that's what made this shit fucking hilarious. Because everybody else was like, man, I mean, I'm getting shot and I'm selling crack. He's like, I'm at the Gap. And they think I'm going to steal from them. So I'm going to get in a spaceship. And oh, yeah, my bitch is an AKA. No, she's a Delta. Woo! I mean, it's like. No, that's why it was so funny. And then he was like, I dropped out of college because I ain't going to make no money, but I'm going to be rich. I ain't going to drive no rap for He is not from the hood, baby. Chicago ain't all Chicago. He's just not. So I feel you. Oh, he's from Chirac. No, he ain't. Well, well here's the thing. Because cause th this, this, this sets it up, though, I think. Neither him nor Michelle is from no scary-ass, dangerous-ass place. They just not. But, but then this brings up this thing, then, that... <laughs> But that's the thing. But here's the thing, right? And I think about how we look at because it's the gap. <laughs> that was where he met racism, sir, at the mall. He met race. I'm, I mean, I just I ain't say it. He said it. The worst thing that it ha he had a car accident. He's like, my my jaw is shut. I'm just saying that's what he that's what he told us. But he had no like fight. He wasn't like, oh my god, I got like jumped out the gang and my jaw is shut. He was like, I had a car accident. Yeah, okay, but, I'm sorry. But, but here's the, is the this is the second glass of wine, by the way. And I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but, not, but jokes aside, because um, kind of pivoting, it's still related, but I'm pivoting to violence. I'm sorry, like, you just can't. I know a lot about Kanye. You can't, okay, we should. Well, no, no. It's, it's, here's the thing, though. It's not so much Kanye. Kanye is a proxy. I say Kanye's a proxy, right? In that it pivots to violence. I'm going to talk about violence. So, um, like I've experienced violence, I've participated in violence, um, but I'm also somebody who's experienced outside of interpersonal violence, I've also experienced structural violence, interpersonal, and ins I mean institutional violence. And I think that's something that people of color can't avoid, right? Um, so, you know, many of us, whether you are from the good part of Chicago, or in Brooklyn now, you know, gentrified part of Brooklyn, or you're from where I'm from in Brooklyn, that's actually now gentrified now, but, um, <laughs> there's still an experience of this sort of violence from the state or is it interpersonal? And so I'm sort of, I guess the question I'm leading towards is as we come from Kanye or maybe stay with him, um, like talk about the relationship between the two. And even though um, you may not be from, you know, I mean, you may not be from Notion Avenue like I'm from, um, you still are a black person in this country. And, the, and we, as we know, the, the trauma that's associated with that experience um, doesn't require you to live in a specific zip code. Okay, so yes and, mm -hmm. no and, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't want to be reductive. Okay. But we do want to be honest, right? So, when I see, um, when I see Beyonce pregnant performing on stage, I know that's a political statement. Right, and I know it's political because I know that 
black women's babies die at twice the rate of white women's babies, no matter what our socioeconomic status. Right? So I know it's actually not class. It, it is um, something we carry in our bodies. So um, it is this, it's one of the stickiest and most baffling realities of, of this medical disparity is that you don't close it with healthcare, you can't close it with education, you can't close it with income, you don't close it with prenatal care. Um, you know, when Serena talks about um, black maternal death, um, when Beyonce talks about the possibility of her own twins dying with the possibility of, of black premature infant death, both of those women remind us that it does, you can't, you cannot, it, it, it is literally our bodies, right? And so we know that that legacy walks all the way back to the plantation, right? So we know that in a country where children inherit the status of the father everywhere and at all times, the only place where they don't is for enslaved women. Right, and so for enslaved women, children inherit the status of the mother. So here, in this place, is the one thing that the first gift of the black womb to our children is enslavement. And it is that reminder, I always say, you cannot be a good slave master, you cannot be a kind slave master, that, that we, we confuse this in our pop culture representations of slavery by focusing on physical violence because it actually doesn't matter if no one ever raises their hand to you because it is the slavery. It is the incarceration. It is the unfreedom. It is the not having your children as your own. And so we know that generation after generation and the data show it is actually not any experience that black pregnant women have during their pregnancies, but it's actually related to childhood experiences so it's like that, it's that middle school sleepover you went to and you had to explain why you were tying your hair up. That's why your baby is born three pounds smaller. So on the one hand, yes, there is an experience of black oppression that is so visceral that we literally pass it through the womb. Serena and Beyonce, right? I mean, you hear like, through the womb. On the other hand, we cannot be so reductive as to imagine that all blackness is equivalent. That all black experiences constitute and feel the weight of the state the same. Because to do so, I think, is to both ignore history and to do things like, God bless her, Michelle Alexander, say things like the new Jim Crow. Oh, you need, need a drink? Because I went in Petty Corner just real quick a little bit. So for me, as the child of a man who grew up under the old and only Jim Crow, no, it's just not the new Jim Crow. It's just the new fucked up criminal justice system. It is its own horrible, terrible, awful thing, and Jim Crow was that thing. Slavery was this thing, Jim Crow is this thing, this incarceral state is this thing. And actually, having an understanding of the designations in ways that are different matters, because we won't fight it the same. We, we not gonna sit in our way out of it. God bless those who sat their way out of that. I mean, let me let me be clear. When I say sit it, like I don't mean that in any kind of small way, because that wasn't simple. You sitting in wasn't sitting in. It was actually laying one's body in the front line of violence and tor like. Let me be clear. I don't mean that in any kind of small way, but it will still require something different. Of all, uh, even in our misunderstanding of what sit-ins were, it will still require something different, right? Because each of these things are different, and I know she ain't actually even make up the title. No, none of us make up our own titles. But we can push back against them when they end up creating an intellectual designation that is inaccurate and that confuses us about what we're doing. 
And so for me, I both want to make and lay claims to like the ways that white supremacy harms all of us. And, I, and, and let me be clear, all of us, white folks, you too. I want y'all to read Jonathan Metzl's new book, Dying of Whiteness, because I know y'all think we the main ones dying of um, gun violence, but let me be really clear, the number one by far, no doubt about it, way more people than in Chirac, people who are dying of gun violence are white men who pick up guns and shoot themselves, like 60%. Whiteness and white supremacy kills mostly white men. So white supremacy is just not serving people. Patriarchy and the violence it does against all of us. But I also just like, I want us to be able to also understand that no, it actually is different to walk in the world without financial resources. It actually is different to walk in the world light skin. It actually is different to walk in the world queer. It actually is different to not walk in the world because you're in a disabled body. It actually, like, so, yes, we all, and then it still matters to see. Thanks for that, like, layered sort of explanation. I'm curious, though, also, now the response from to violence in our communities? Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. No, you answer that question. I'm just, what I'm leading to though is that the responses to violence in our community, particularly interpersonal violence, has always been with the heavy hand of the justice system. It's always that, that's all we've ever known um, in terms of how to respond to violence. And I'm wondering, I mean, what do you think? Are there alternatives? Or should we be thinking about other ways to respond to violence in our communities. Because obviously, I mean, I always say if you used to evaluate the way they do uh, non-profits, you know, you have to do these evaluations of your deliverables and whatnot. If you were to evaluate the way in which the justice system has been effective or ineffective in its response to violence, historically you will see that it has failed um, in terms of how we responded to violence uh, with the heavy hand. I mean, do you see any other ways to respond to the violence that we have in communities all over the country? Back up for me. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, the response to violence? You put people in jail. Who puts people in jail? Uh, the police put people in jail. Our judges put people in jail. Because of what? The response to violence is that. What violence? Gun violence, interpersonal violence, sexual violence. Um, that has been... The police put people in jail because of sexual violence and interpersonal violence and gun violence in she's, our community. She's interviewing me now. Already? Oh, she's like, we got five minutes. Wow. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, why I'm... I'm why, do about this. why do police put people in jail? They put, peop they put me in jail for interpersonal violence. Tell me. Let's not go willing. through... No, tell me, if you're willing, what you mean. Um... When uh, uh, folks commit what we consider as an act of violence towards somebody else, a harm, um, the response, in many cases, the advocacy, sadly, from some of our community folks, is to put people in jail. What do you think is a different response? What do I think is or should be a different response? What do you think is a possible different response? I mean, I think we have mechanisms, as we think about square one, um, you know, there are people who are trying out different things, whether it be from a restor restorative space, restorative justice space, a transformative justice space. Use people real words. Trying. Use words that if people aren't well, in the Well, here's the thing. All right, here's the thing. So we just don't worry about us, about us talking. I think we don't center the people who are literally harmed by the violence, mm -hmm. right? So the intermediary area is the state. The state figures out, you've been harmed, sit back, we don't handle that for you. And then we build these big buildings and throw you in there, and that's how we deal with it. Uh, we don't center the people and what they really need. So there's just a, uh, we're not really addressing the harm we're not centering the people who are hurting. And, we're not, and, and the hurting is on both sides. The person who committed the harm is hurting mm -hmm. somewhere along the lines, and obviously the person who was harmed is, is hurting. What would that look like? In terms of, what do you mean? So what would it look like to center those two people? Um, I think for me, uh, as a survivor of sexual violence as well, um, as a kid, as a 14-year-old person, and I think about that now, and rarely do I ever feel better thing about if the, I don't know what this person, I don't even know this person. Um, but I don't wish that this person was in some sort of 
prison, I've been there. I know that it wouldn't fix whatever he is, was dealing with. Um, but that's our response. That's our sort of response is that, you know what? He, she, they need to go into this place because that's how you fix it. Um, so I'm sort of, uh, this, this conversation or this sort of, this issue around what to do differently, we rarely ask, one, we rarely give people options to think differently. We rarely give them options. Um, therefore, the only, or, or the only option that folks ever have is to, well, the state, you handle that. I'm gonna come to court, or maybe not. Um, I don't have to come to court in some cases, and I'll put you away. Um, so I think for us, um, we, if you think about this whole thing about doing differently, we need to figure out ways to censor people, the people who are hurt. Because here's the thing, there's no dichotomy between, of the hurt. You know, uh, we spoke earlier today that people who are often involved in gun violence um, got bullets on their own. They got bullets in their chest, or even at me, I had a bullet, you know, also. Um, so no one asked us what we should do, uh, or what we wanted. Um, so I think that ultimately, as we think about this conversation, about what we need to do around violence, um, we need to figure out a way to take, that's what centering people looks like. That's what centering the person. Somebody should have asked Marlon, what did you want to do? Well, first, here's the thing, even before you get to that point, we need to create a space where people feel safe enough to talk about the harm, right? As a, as a, as a, as a boy growing up, um, that was just like what you deal with. That's just, that's just what happens, you know what I mean? And, and, and I think particularly in the world where you speak about patriarchy also is hurting us all. It prevents us from talking about, oh damn, this happened when I was a kid. Um, we just hold that, and we figure out ways to do it. Patriarchy tells us to do different things. Have as much sex as you can. Smoke as much drugs or weed or start hanging out on the block. Like it tells, that's how you deal with it, right? You just, that's how you avoid it. Um, so, so many ways, like the, 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 the fact that we are um, not centering people. Like what, what, what do you need? Not only what do you need, how can we create a space where you have to, you feel comfortable talking about and identifying in this harm and not just charge it to the streets or what have you. Um, then you can go to the place of asking what is it we can do, what do you need? And it's rarely, it rarely fix, it's rarely fixed by that person going away. Because if you go away, the harm is still there. It, it didn't happen. I didn't even get to talk to you about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just got to go to court. Um, anyway, so, I, you know, it, 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 in some ways, people may call that a radical thing to do. Um, but in so many ways, it's just the human thing to do. We start off speaking about um, Kanye as a human person. Um, and in so many ways, we have decentered the humanity in the justice that we consider uh, that's necessary for us. Um, I like the way that, yes, I see you. Uh, I like the way that this conversation became, uh, but here's the thing, I appreciate this. I understand the skill in it. Um, <laughs> um, in that, here's a couple things you're doing, and I think what we need to do is just sort of model it. Um, one, I believe that we, within ourselves, have so many answers within us, we have so many answers, particularly those people who have been harmed. Um, we don't think they do. Um, or we don't think we do in so many cases. Um, and what that is only doing in so many ways is, is it's, it's perpetuating harm over and over and over again, over again, and to the point where now we don't even know how to, what, how to identify it. Um, so we are swinging blanks. And it's kind of like book ending with Kanye in so many ways. And so many, it's how this worked out. Um, but you have people who just don't know where to identify it, where to go. And we put money and we invest in not knowing. Ultimately, we invest billions of dollars in not knowing what to do. And then somehow we put our faith, I always like to say we pledge our allegiance in not knowing. And then we export it to other countries and they do the same thing over and over again. Um, I know that we have to sort of wrap this up, uh, MHP, um, but in so many ways, I know this was an interview for me to interview you, and that sort of, it sort of started that way. But, but, 
But I mean, but here's the thing, I, what I appreciate about this sort of conversation, one is um, before the conversation, we, we, we share like a, you know, a moment, right? Um, and in so many ways, like I didn't know what your moment was, but I know you started asking me about, tell me about your brother and your, and your sister. I don't, I, I've never met MHP in my life. I've you know, seen on TV like you are, but I've never met her. Um, but there's a human connection that you asked me about, and there's a story behind that. Um, and we started sharing that, and then something else happened, and you know, it touched you personally. Um, but I think we're thinking about square one and, uh, or, or how to reimagine justice. Like we are like kind of modeling it here in so many ways. Um, this sort of healing process requires the most human interaction, the most human connection. Um, that doesn't require always an intermediary to say, you know what, go back over there, I'm gonna do it over here. Because then that takes away the human connection that we have. Because here's the thing, we, you know, we spoke about earlier today in the, in the convening that we have, but you know, uh, and I just uh, mentioned a little bit a little while ago, but this sort of way we think about victim and perpetrator mm -hmm. um, and witness, uh, and summoning Monica Bell who's in the audience, um, this is a false separation. It's particularly for those of us, we spoke about 400 years, white folks, you too, right? You're part, you're witnessing this. You're perpetrating it, and you're also being harmed by each other by it. Um, and we have to understand that um, what we need to think about from square one is like, damn, we started off with, we are human. You know, we started off with that. And I think that's the perfect way to sort of, sort of like close this conversation. And I mean, if you wanna offer any closing words, um, I'll definitely leave that to you. But for me, the way I want to sort of want to bookend this is saying that as we're thinking about reimagining justice, we need to reimagine the connection. We need to reimagine humanity um, and our capacity to be fully human. I don't think sometimes we, I think sometimes we, um, we, we, we inhibit our ability to fully experience our humanity. Um, and, 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 and in this conversation, we need to think about that. We need to do what you just did to me. We need to sort of like, as you said earlier, break the rules. We need to flip the script. We need to do things that's unconventional um, to be able to sort of experience that humanity. This is a conversation between you and I, and I appreciate you for being able to have this conversation with me. Um, I call you sis now. Can I, I, all right, Absolutely. all right. <laughs> so um, the, the students who I'm traveling with didn't know this earlier. Um, so I carry the title, um, my Angelo professor, but they, um, they're young. They didn't know that when I was in college, Maya Angelou was my uh, advisor. And she had many lessons. Um, but the one I try to carry is, um, uh, she'd say, um, I'm human, therefore nothing human can be alien to me. <coughs> um, and what she would emphasize to us is anything a human is capable of, you're capable of. Which means, I mean, not like specifically, like you can't do Jordan's jump shot <laughs> specifically. Right, um, um, but if humans are capable of greatness, you're capable of greatness, full stop. So, you know, if Da Vinci was getting down with some brilliance, you can be brilliant. If um, humans are capable of reimagining their governing structure like Jefferson, then so can you. And so Jefferson and Da Vinci were white boys, so what? You're a black girl, you can, like, you're human. Get at it. And I don't care what you see someone doing. They're not a monster. And they're not an animal. They're human. And guess what, baby? You're capable of that. Just nurture it a little bit. Just like you can nurture your intelligence and your capacity for greatness, give your evil a little bit of time. Spend a little bit of time with the monstrous inside of you, and I promise you, you two are capable of every monstrous, animalistic, evil thing you see. No one is an animal, and no one is a monster. Everybody's human. Everything that every human being is capable of, you are capable of. Now, by the time I knew Dr. Angelo, she was in her late 60s, early 70s, it's easy to forget that the woman who was saying that to me, that there are no monsters, that every person is capable of everything, was raped as an eight-year-old girl. So it is not a light thing 
for her to say that. To say there are no monsters. And that the work is to nurture the thing that makes you Da Vinci, not the monster. Because it's all in all of us all the time. Always. And the work of those of us who have the grace and good fortune of public life is to ask whether or not we are nurturing in the public space the things that make all of us into the Harriet Tubmans and the Ida Wells and the Frederick Douglasses and the greatest, best, highest selves, or whether we're nurturing the things that make us into the most divisive and painful and swinging at nothing selves. No matter what it costs us, we have to push towards I mean, we're allowed to get in our petty corners a little bit because we're human, because we're human, not perfect, human. But like we are forced to see each other and to see into ourselves. And I'm also reminded that the reason Dr. Angela stopped speaking wasn't because she was raped, it was because her uncles killed her rapist and she felt that her words created violence. So I try to make sure my words don't create violence. And so when you ask me what else is possible it's always to go back to Dr. Angelo and to say that even people who experienced violence and who had to become silent and retreat into themselves until they could heal can still become great healers by teaching and by reminding us of our humanity. And so sometimes that will be institutional, sometimes it will be interpersonal, um, it will always be structural, it will always be forward-looking, and it will always be revolutionary. Thank you. Everyone, uh, I hope you it appreciated our breaking up the rules, um, our conversation, um, our humanity, um, and in so many ways, um, model modeling the process of healing. Um, so for those, you know, you know, in so many ways we think about what justice looks like, I, you know, the work that we do and imagining justice as an entity, as a thing, the justice that I think that we need to be, for this moment right here, is reimagining justice for ourselves. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I think if it's okay with everyone, I, I thank you all for that. Um, I think probably might be good for us to to take to take some time together to step out and breathe the air and talk a little bit. Um, the food and wine are still outside, and we hope you'll enjoy it with us until we are kicked out of the space in about 31 minutes. Um, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, we, we, to, to, to follow that with Q&A feels uh, like it might not be the thing to do right now. And I just want to thank you both for your honesty and your openness and your willingness to reimagine at a, at a personal level that I think inspires all of us at a personal and, and, and much larger level too. So with that, it's an honor. Thank you to all of you all for being here. Thank you to all who are live streaming this incredible conversation. Um, please continue to, to join us uh, at, with Square One, at Square Number One Justice, and Reimagine Justice. And uh, to these folks, thank you for your, for your, for your leadership tonight. Good night, everyone. <laughs>